In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Word of God is the foundation upon our lives are meant to be built. For the times in which we fail to place our faith on that rock-sturdy foundation, we pause and ask our Lord for mercy and forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, Ever-Virgin, all of the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who through the preaching of St. Francis Xavier won many peoples to yourself, Grant that the hearts of the faithful may burn with the same zeal for the faith, and that the Holy Church may everywhere rejoice in abundance of offspring. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On that day they will sing this song in the land of Judah. A strong city have we. He sets up walls and ramparts to protect us. Open up the gates to let in a nation that is just, one that keeps faith. A nation of firm purpose you keep in peace, in peace for its trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord is an eternal rock. He humbles those in high places, and the lofty city he brings down. He tumbles it to the ground, levels it with the dust. It is trampled underfoot by the needy, by the footsteps of the poor. The word of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Open to me the gates of justice. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This gate is the Lord's. The just shall enter it. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and have been my Savior. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O Lord, grant salvation. O Lord, grant prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house. 
but it did not collapse. It had been set solidly on rock. And everyone who listens to these words of mine, but does not act on them, will be like a fool who built his house in the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house, and it collapsed and was completely ruined. The Gospel of the Lord. You get to see all kinds of things in pastoral ministry when you're going out and ministering to the people of God. Some of them are funny and entertaining, other times it's actually downright serious. And I remember this one particular incident that I had to deal with in terms of a couple that I was preparing for marriage. Uh, conventionally, when somebody has to get married, they know they have the six-month rule. They need to call at least six months before their wedding so that they can begin the process of the paperwork and do the preparations, make sure the exact date is on the calendar, and the church can get everything prepared in order for them to do so. So like any other wedding, I got the phone call. Uh, the names that I heard were not necessarily familiar because I was new in the parish at the time. Uh, I scheduled the first appointment for them, and then they came into my office. And it was a standard conventional conversation about wedding prep, except there was one thing that was a little bit different. She was white and he was African-American. Now, that's not an issue at all, unless you live in Louisiana or places of the South, where it begins to be a little taboo. And being from a small town, you know how it is. If that happens, oftentimes people raise their eyebrow because everybody has their own idea about uh, what marriage should look like and who should marry who and all the social injustices and taboos of the day. Uh, we did marriage prep. It was conventional as usual. But I got to tell you what the disappointment was. Got there for the wedding day. None of her family was there. When I say none, I mean zero. The other church, the half of the church was filled with all the rest of the groom's family, but she had absolutely nobody there. So after it was over with, we talked a little bit. I asked how she felt about it, and, and she was actually okay. She came to reconcile that in her own mind, her own heart. But she told me something that her parents had told her that it stuck and really became the formative part of who she was. When she started her dating life, her parents called her in the living room and said, you could date anybody you want as long as they're not a black man. And that stuck with her. And she remembered going out and doing dating, and she fell in love with this particular gentleman. That ended up being her soulmate, and she decided, you know what? This is who I'm going to marry. It doesn't matter what the family said. It doesn't matter that we're different than one another. God brought us together. There's love, and because of that, we decided that we're going to get married. She was someone who built her house on rock, as the scripture said. Jesus gives this interesting little parable, and I think there's some points about it that we need to remember ourselves, especially in terms of how we go about building up our faith and living out our lives. It's interesting, Jesus was a carpenter, so using the image of carpentry is actually a pretty easy one for him. What's the first principle that you see? Well, some people build wisely, and other people build foolishly. You know that, especially in your experience. Some people build their faith life on a rock-sturdy foundation. God has to be the capstone. And if it's built on anything else, on any other reason why we worship or believe or even come to church, it's actually shoddy construction. It's built on sand. And what happens? Well, when the storm comes, it's tested. Uh, the second point, well, what is our life built out of? It's interesting because we choose the building materials as we're the builders. I always remember my grandfather used to tell me, you get what you pay for, right? He was one of those people that went to the grocery. When he was going to have a, a nice steak at night, he was getting the prime thing, right? He's like, I worked hard for it. I'm paying for it. And I'm getting what I pay for. Uh, if you pay for something that's cheap, it might last a little while, but you know what's going to happen. Five days later, it's going to be all said and done. When it comes to building the edifice of our faith, we're responsible for what we use and how we go about building it. And if you want to be cheap at it, well, go ahead. But again, storms are out there. And will it be able to stand the test of what the storm is? And perhaps that's the revelation of today's gospel. Oh, storms come at every opportunity that they can. 
Think about it. 2020, we've been tested with storm after storm, wave after wave of pandemic and virus and all the other mess that's happened in our country and in our own personal lives. Some people have actually not dealt with this in a very good way. Why? Because their house is an edifice that could simply fall whenever any storm would come. But this is actually, I think, a wonderful test of our faith. How do we get through it? How do we survive it together? How do we cope and pivot and do what we need to do in order to live out a good foundation of faith? Because when the storms come, whatever we build will ultimately have to endure the test. And some will stand, but others might not be able to. In terms of living out faith, I think, it's always important to remember that good old principle. You have to not only preach it, but you got to practice it. Do you live out and embody what it is that you say? I started out with that image of that couple that I work with, and I remember when I was living in D.C., I went to see Jefferson's home, uh, the president of the United States, right? Beautiful place, but one of the interesting things about Jefferson is that he put one thing on paper and he left something else out. And as he did so, you're starting to see the historical repercussions. Uh, He talked about freedom. He was one of the authors of the Declaration of Independence. He owned slaves himself. Some of his slaves were his mistresses. Uh, How do you reconcile those two things? Well, it's like the house that we build. If it's strong, if it's on sturdy rock, it's going to stand the test of time, hundreds and hundreds of years. But if it's not, what happens? One little storm comes and poof, it's gone. It's blown away. When it comes to your faith, what have you built your faith life on? Is it on rock-sturdy foundations? Is God really the center of what you believe and why you believe it? Or are there other reasons upon which you have actually built the foundation of your life? What are the materials that you use when going about building up that life of faith? Do you cut corners Or instead, do you invest wisely, spend a little bit of cash in the meantime, but you get what you actually pay for? Do you use the principal virtues of patience and love and charity and generosity when building up that life of faith? Or do you sometimes just kind of cut the corners to make it a little bit easier? And when the storms come, because they do, every five seconds, will you be able to stand up to those storms that actually come in your life of faith? Do you not only put it on paper and say it, but did you believe it and show other people that you believe it by how you go about living it? Those are the important construction blocks, if you will, in building a good life of faith. And if we listen to the wisdom of the carpenter, I think our life will be able to make a really good life that's a foundation of faith that can be emulated by other folks. I was in contact with that couple that I talked about at the very beginning. There's been reconciliation that's happened in the family. Uh, They actually have many kids together. I'm going on a priest now, 13, 14 years now. So they've been married for about 13 or 14 years. And why? Well, because they built a good house. They knew what they were doing. And they didn't really care what storms were out there. As we prepare to celebrate the Eucharist, let's not cut corners. Let's invest wisely. And by doing so, build an edifice that will last forever. We stand to place before our God all of our prayers of petition and of need, that we might not have duplicity in our life of faith, but instead may we always practice what it is that we preach, We pray to the Lord that we might continue to emulate the virtues of faith, hope, and charity in building up our journey of faith in the house in which we live. We pray to the Lord that throughout this Advent season, we might continue to prepare to meet our Maker whenever He might come. We pray to the Lord. For beloved dead who've gone before us marked with the sign of faith, and for those for whom this Mass is being offered, we pray to the Lord. And for the prayers, the petition, and need that we offer up in the silence of our hearts.
May we constantly build up our life of faith, O God, around you as the center and source, the foundation upon which we build. Provide the needs that we place before your altar through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Receive, O Lord, these offerings we bring you in commemoration of St. Francis Xavier, and grant that as he journeyed to distant lands out of longing for the salvation of souls, so we too, bearing effective witness to the gospel, may with our brothers and sisters eagerly hasten toward you. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For in the marvelous confession of the saints, you make your church fruitful with strength ever new and offer us your signs of your love and that your saving mysteries may be fulfilled. Their great example lends us courage. Their fervent prayer sustains us in all we do. And so, Lord, with all the angels and the saints, we too give you thanks. As an exultation, we acclaim. Holy, holy. In the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Michael, our bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer to each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. May your mysteries, O God, kindle in us that fire of charity with which St. Francis Xavier burned for the salvation of souls, so that, walking ever more worthily in our vocation, we may obtain with him the reward you promise to those who labor well in your harvest. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Have a good day.